it's an absolute honour for me to be here today to introduce an incredible person who's come here to share some information with us all today. I've actually heard him speak twice before, so I know you're in for an absolute treat. He's Sunday Times number one best-selling author. He's an international inspirational speaker and presentation skills coach. Let's go, coach, sorry. Let's please get up Sandy, because he's come all the way to give us some information today. For the one and only Richard McCann. <laughs> Association annual conference. I was there as a delegate listening to presentation after presentation. Can I just say something? Pete, you would have blown them away because none of them moved me like you moved me when I was sat in the back listening to how your dad put his hand up to that kind of outstanding. about 1 o'clock this afternoon and I left at 10 a.m. this morning. I left early. I missed out on a few sessions. So uh, Danny London got the train up here and I'll come straight here. Uh, and the reason I did that is um, because I can. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just because I can. It's I love what I do. If you don't love what you do, you shouldn't be doing it. But I also love people. And I also love all of you too. And I mean that. Because my favourite audience to date, or audiences that have been to Queen Eat Day, uh, both uh, the two regional events and the, uh, the one at the National Indoor Arena on the 7th of uh, January 2012. Who was there, by the way? Who? You're all there! <laughs> Let's get off home, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, know, you, you know all about ICANN. Uh, you know all about ICANN. Who's not heard me speak before? Uh, nine of you. <laughs> I didn't have to read the books, did I? You've been on me. But I thought it was something different today. It's not I can, it's, uh, it's can I. <coughs> can I. Continuous and never-ending improvement. Continuous and never-ending improvement. Which is what you've been sharing uh, already, uh, uh, Pete. But that continuous or continual and never-ending improvement is, I guess, how I've lived my life. And by the way, uh, I'm sure I get my uh, elephant in the room out of the way. That thing that most of you are aware of, that uncomfortable thing that you're all aware of. And for those of you that have not seen it, but you've probably heard there's something really uncomfortable that I have to share. Let's get out of the way right from the start. It is true what you've heard many, many years ago. Many, many years ago. I hate sharing this, you know. I hate sharing this. But many, many years ago. I was born with ginger hair! <laughs> <laughs> That was the age five. Where's all the ginger masses? Come on, where's all the gingers? Hey, <laughs> five! I was brought, I mean, you must be know this story, because I was brought up on a, on a Leeds council to say, uh, very similar to what Pete was uh, sharing, that house there on the far right, with, uh, with my mum, my three sisters, and my dad, uh, Bankless Ogre. Not my words. Those are the words that the social services used to describe him in the file that they kept on us as a family. On the atmosphere, just 126 visits by the social workers by the time I was fired. I've got the fire at home. That description of my father was quite accurate. A big drinker, very violent man. You did not want to get in his way. So when he left when I was four, he was good riddance. But then came Jimmy. Jimmy. Uh, Mum's boy, he was worse than that. Right. He used to give us drugs. He abused my sister Sonia, which she kept to herself until about 10 years ago when she told me what he'd been doing to her. It all made sense. Her own problems with alcohol, drugs. Violent partners. You ever come across people like that? There's always a reason for that kind of behaviour, isn't there? Sent to prison for beating my mum. My mum. Most of you know me. Mum and her Who, um. Well, yeah, what happened? Yeah, most of you know what happened. She went out drinking the week before my sixth birthday and we never saw her again. Do you know what? I'll never forget that night. I I'll never forget that night. I'll never forget that morning. And so my sister shook me awake at 5 30 in the morning and she said, Oh, wait, wait, wait. By the way, I'm going to sh share something different. I didn't I've, not, I've never told another audience this before. I'm going to tell you, because it's you. I want to do something different. You see that house there? That's not the house that my mum lived in. 
That's our net of our, our I lived in the room. That's the house. And the next door neighbor, her name was Vera. Vera lived on her own. She was an elderly lady. She couldn't go to the shop. And at the age of five, I went round there and she asked me, she asked me to go to the shop for her. She gave me a little list. I had to go over main road as well. We did that back then in the 70s. And she gave me a few pence for going. And I realised back then as a five-year-old kid, that if I kept going round to her house again and again and again, she would ask me to go again, again and again. And it would improve my situation. Continual and never any improvement. That's what I was doing back then at the age of five. And that mindset's been with me ever since. Sonia, my beloved sister, she said, she said well, go, Mum's not come on, let's go look for her. And by the way, that walk with Sonia, uh, that walk on the, on the field in the back of the house, down that path, is a walk I'll never forget. We all have moments in our lives, do we, that we will never forget. £195 for that car, for that bike, sorry, I'll never forget that. Uh, your story. <laughs> I don't forget that walk, I don't forget sitting at the bus stop, sitting at the bus stop, waiting for the first bus to arrive, hoping that mum was going to be on it, and she wasn't, of course. I remember walking back to the house, hoping she might have arrived over in a taxi, but she didn't. I'll never forget the police asking questions. When did you last see your mum? Where's your dad? Do you have any photographs of your mum? I'll never forget being taken from that house and never returning again, and arriving at this, this, this children's home. I uh, think it's Pat Tones on, I'm never going to get it, arriving there. Uh, I was loving it actually, I was loving it. Cups of cocoa, we never had cocoa, fussing over us. I was loving it until the police officer told us, I'm going to forget when he couched down. It must have been, must have been like a half for him to tell us this, to tell four kids that the mum had been taken to heaven and that we weren't going to see her again. And it's 40 years, this month since that. You was really broken to me. And I never thought back then I would ever bounce back from that. I would never recover from that. It didn't tell us what happened. But most of you in this room are aware what happened that was. <coughs> murdered by the man called Peter Sutcliffe or the Yorkshire Ripper. He murdered 13 women and my mum well known the camp was the first of 13 women to die. And although that's true, there's still a part of me that doesn't want to accept that. We all go through things in life. We all have challenges, don't we? Sometimes it's so bad you don't want to accept it, but I have accepted it now. Do you know what? That disadvantage, let's call it, has become my greatest advantage because me losing my mum in that way has given me a strength and ability to connect with people, to sit down with people going through their own challenges, not just people that have been murdered or family members murdered. I can sit down with people going through challenges and connect with them in a way that I might not have been able to do had my mum not died. Sometimes that disadvantage becomes that biggest advantage. I remember that children's zone. I hated it. You know what I was speaking about, mum? They wouldn't, let, they wouldn't let us speak about me, Mum. And I couldn't stop thinking, I think they were protecting our feelings, actually. And I can't understand why they wouldn't let us go to Mum's funeral. And I can't understand why this picture of me and my three sisters was put in the papers. And that's how my Mum's family discovered what had happened. Can you imagine that? Finding out that your sister had been killed by somebody in the papers. But I'm so pleased and grateful that they decided to, <laughs> to play something with my father. Pete, I could, uh, I could resonate with your story of losing your father because since I spoke to you guys in 2012, most of you, and I have lost my father. And he died on the 21st of January. Coincidentally, the same day that my mum was laid to rest. Passed away like that. And uh, but I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful that I actually forgave my father in 2007. And uh, I've had a relationship with him for the last seven years. It's never been the, the kind of relationship with Pete had. It is the kind that I had a relationship with my father. And despite in the past me saying that I really am regretful that I was placed with my father, actually I'm glad I was placed with my father, despite him being a violent person. Because I love him. And I miss him so much. He taught me so much, actually. Um, I remember arriving at this house, by the way. This is, this, I'm not sure what that council said. Another, uh, other, another council state, other side of the like peace. And um, I remember arriving there thinking, up until this point, why? 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 I'm really bad, and this little six-year-old boy said this to himself. By the way, the most important conversations you ever have are the ones you have with yourself. And I told myself, I know why. Mum has been taken by God. Away from all this violence, and me and my sisters are better. My dad has got a new girlfriend. She can be my mum. I have no idea how that six-year-old boy was able to think in that way. Because I don't listen to any motivational speakers. But what I believe now as a 44-year-old man, do you know what, when you go through a challenge, that ability to find your own little ray of sunshine in that dark cloud is an ability we've all got. I learned that back nearly 40 years ago and it's been with me ever since. 
Do we, have, do we have any positive people in the room? Any positive people? Yay. Any negative people? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows a negative person? <laughs> <laughs> no, who's, who's the first time? Oh, no, who's positive? Oh, who's positive? Yeah, that was the, yeah. What's your name? Angela. Angela. Angela, where did you get your positivity from? Pink Have you got it with you? You'll get it, <laughs> It's not something that you can give to people. Actually, you can give to people by like, talking in a positive way. It's a choice! It's a choice! When you go to your car three weeks ago and a wing has been smashed off and the glass is on the floor. Can I do how I felt? That was just a bit. Wow! I was! I was just a bit! They've not hit the body of the car, you know, in short, it's, it's, it's actually, your premiums go up. They've not hit the body of the car, because the £65 pounds replaced that minute. And I was chuffed that they not touched the body of the car. Positivity. When you, when you lose your client, when you lose a member of your team, you've got to be positive, you've got to dust yourself down. Pete said it already. Pete, you're not even meeting me here. When most of the special people have ever met? <laughs> Isn't he? Yeah. Isn't he? Yeah. My God. <laughs> uh, I went to the toilet, went to the toilet, goodness me, they don't that good. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I was positive about it, although it wasn't quite the positive life I was hoping for. My father, or oh, bless him. He was with a stick, he drowned the dog in the bath. Uh, put the step on the hospital with a broken rib and a punctured lung. He got the idea. Although 95% of the time it was alright, so he found that whiskey out of the bottle, that's when you didn't want to get it. But as I said, it was a I figured it out. And, um, I don't know, I should say something to, for some new information. Um, just go back to that picture, pick it back up, pick it back up again. Yeah. Um, I was asked by the, um, Kind of all the housing associations around the UK to be the face of the uh, National Housing Day on the 12th of November. They asked me to go back to my old house and stand outside it and make a little video. Uh, and I did. And, uh, actually, the door was open, so I knocked on the door. I let it inside. I knocked on the door. There's this woman in the living room. She's on the phone. I said, Excuse me. She came this black one came up to me. She said, uh, Yeah. I said, I used to live here. I said, I want to make a video. You live, live there. Come in, she said. This East African woman, by the way, a refugee. She's been fed violence. She said, Come in. I said, Yeah, I used to live here. She said, Oh, she said, This is a special house. I said, no, it is. Because they signed what I said, and I found there were some brilliant members of that house. She go up to your old bedroom, she said. I went down to your old house, and your old bedroom. There was a thing in the, in the corner of the bedroom, like a wooden shelf that you spot on the toilet, and there was my little hiding place. I remember that, she went back in time. But, but this is what made me cry. I'm such an emotional wreck, like uh, Peter. But... Came down into the living room, she said to me, bless her. I mean, who would say this? She said, we're going away in August. She says, why don't you come and stop at the house? <laughs> <laughs> Mariana, her name is Mariana, because we're friends with Mariana. But who would say that? I don't know, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. Anyway, back then, and that was a bit like Pete, I used to go to my mate's houses that had all the nice wallpaper. He had budget wallpaper, we had nothing. We had bare walls and, and like purple paint, but on the roof was like white uh, purple paint that had fallen off the ceiling. And I used to like lay on bed, lay in the bed, and just look at all these uh, white patches and I'd make like take pictures out of the natural like, my activity and uh, so I was jealous of his budget paper. Um, <laughs> but this was me, look by the way, is that a genuine smile? That's my school picture. That's not a genuine smile. I hated who I was. They're all better than me. I'm damaged good. Never gonna I'm out to anything. And to top it off, to make matters even worse. <laughs> I had ginger hair as well. <laughs> I love my ginger hair. Um, look at me clothes, look at me clothes. I was, a, I, was, I was a wreck, I was a mess. Although I have to say this, and I, I haven't shared this with many people, I used to lay in bed and have a beating for something or other, and uh, I had this conversation with myself. Don't worry, Richard, don't worry. Because what you're experiencing right now, what you're going through right now, <coughs> You're supposed to be going through because you're going to help people out all around the world in years to come. They know about speaking, they know about writing books, and I, I, I have no idea what I meant, but I just thought to myself, I'll tell you what, that kind of thought process helped me make my situation at the time a little easier to cope with. 1983, oh, by the way, me and Sonia weren't off the rails, we were drinking, we were sitting, that kind of thing. Went off the rails. That big Sonia was there, we sat in the afternoon, uh, the house was done. Bottom of the stairs, just uh, behind the front door, he beat her to a pulp. She was, uh, well, damaged her shoulder, kept her off school, but uh, didn't want to get caught, did he? But she was eventually allowed out of the house and she went to Cal Conman! Cal Conman, I used to fancy Cal Conman. Beautiful, dark, 
I was like, a bet. Anyway, I extended its wings on, I extended its wings on stage, I extended its wings, I extended its wings. Pull <laughs> 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 its wings off. You were loving it. You were loving it. Hey, you can't handle the birds, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I walked down the steps. That, that was it. The door was at the side of the hall. <laughs> the doors were open. I threw the picture up in the air.
And they said that little white line. Finish my basic training, this is me, my basic training. Ginger hair, they can do the music. Walked her up to Germany, got myself a German girlfriend, Petra. The amusing, the amusing thing about Petra was she was German, but when she spoke English, she had this Glaswegian accent, like so funny. Uh, this is 1989, something massive, monumental in fact. Happened in Germany in 1989. Does everyone know what it was? Oh. No, the girlfriend dumped me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what these guys are doing, yeah, all came down, isn't that what life's like? You can plan all you want, and I'm just hope you've got a plan. But you can't predict everything that's going to take place in your life. Well, you can see that wall coming down, especially in the forces. And a month later, this happened. The, the murder case book series was published, and my secret was out. People were coming up to me, my fellow gunners on the gun and the wrong artillery. Uh, 2487 2388. And, um, oh, this is yours, this is your mum. And you know what I did? I, I felt like I did as a young person. I thought I was good, damaged. And I want to tell you this a few years ago, but I had a breakdown and I ended up on the, on the psych psychiatric ward of Hanover Military Hospital. And just when I thought I was going to get some professional help, they kicked me out. They said I was unfit for army service. They said I had a personality disorder. What are you thinking now? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think yeah, I just think, I don't think they want to deal with Get rid of him, and they did. Came back to Leeds. And I did the thing that we've got to do when things don't go our way. We can't turn back the clock. You can't lose once a year, you do have to. <laughs> but we can't go back in time, can we? I couldn't go back to the army. I couldn't bring my mum back, but we can decide what we're going to do next. So I dusted myself down. I done it. <laughs> and I got back on the ladder, so to speak. I got myself another job. I'm going to do with Sonia. My next job was stacking boxes in the warehouse. Sacking boxes in the warehouse. I was one of the best stacking of boxes that they had. Every job I've ever done. Every job I've ever done. I tried to be the best. I always tried to get a little bit better. I always tried to improve. Continual and never really improve. But it's, uh, it paid off for me because Stuart Hard, Stuart Hard in the warehouse man, a bit like Mr. Hill, able to see something in me that I didn't see. He took me to one side and said, Victor, we're going to install a computer system in the warehouse. I want you to run it. Me. I said, I've got your pay rise. I did. She said, I told Nick was the financial director. She said, I told Nick you're a this one there. I told Nick you're your, your management material. I never cried. <coughs> Can you imagine? Me. I went out there. And I kind of lived up to his expectations and I got myself a shirt and tie, got myself a briefcase from Oxfam. Second hand briefcase, like bad corners on it. <coughs> All of it in my briefcase when I went to, to work on the morning. It was there, let me pack up, be packing up. I thought it was like a city gen. And, and I grew. I grew again. And I uh, got my own place. But it's not much, but my own place. I was living with Sonia, as I said, and she had a job by now. Um, that one there. My master and my first floor flat. I just go down that bit. First floor flat. Perfect. Perfect, because you can only just see it. They see that little building there. That's where it works. That one on the right. Two minutes to walk to work. No one says. I want to say it was perfect after I've been living there for three years and I'm burgled uh, every, every year, I'm uninsurable. And I'm sleeping with a big knife under my pillow because I thought they might, they might break into my family. See, when you get your mum murdered, when you're beating your sticks as a kid, you see the world as a threatening place. I thought they might break in, I'll be ready for them. Thankfully, they didn't. But at that point, it was far from perfect. But I'm a great believer. After every negative thing that's happened in my life, every challenge, every dark cloud that I've found myself in, there's always been a ray of sunshine. I know what I'll do! It might not sound like much, but you know you're posh. Uh, in Harrogate. <laughs> Harrogate. Um, I'll buy my own house. I'll buy my own house. I used to think that people that own their own homes are better than me. Those are the homes that you got calcium into at Christmas. We used to go calcium at Christmas. <laughs> you couldn't clean these at the same time, could you? <laughs> I'll buy my own house. If I didn't cross my fingers and just go, I want to buy my own house. Well, you've got to do something. You've got to do some work. You've got to make some sacrifices. My sacrifices were I used to save up for a deposit on my house. Yeah, I'd go out with me every once in a while, but I'd save up for that deposit. And now I can't tell you how proud I was. At the age of 24, I thought about my mum looking down from up above. Hey, look, he's got his own house. Next door neighbour was a CID officer, got a bank loan for a car. Oh my goodness. <coughs> but it didn't last. Because the guys I were working with, Simon, Going out on the weekend and taking drugs. For some stupid reason, I went down the wrong path. 
speed, ecstasy, cocaine. You can't take drugs like that and have it not affect your health. I was in hospital. Two of my friends are dead. I lost my job. Damn. That was, you know, most of you, innit? But I started dealing drugs to my friends and got arrested. Right through the sewer. Got sent to a magistrate's prison leads. Holland is by the way. Same prison that Peter Sutcliffe was sent to when he was first arrested. He's not there now, so it's brought my hospital. I will never forget that journey from Leeds Crown Court. You know, I arrived in there panicking. Oh my goodness, me. How on earth? When I get to come here, you know, I told myself, I know I sound mad, I told myself that God had intervened so that I'd be given the opportunity to turn my life around. You know, what I also said was, change your circle of friends. Peter said, you've got to hang around with the right people. Change your circle of friends. Stay away from the drugs and never put yourself at risk of returning to a place like that. But even so, it was horrible. It was hell. A lot of people have said all day, not being able to go where you want to go and do what you want to do. Horrible for you. Anybody here serve time in prison? <coughs> really, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Oh, well, yeah, I'm sorry. <coughs> no, but during my experience, and more people have not been to prison, they might as well be in prison because they don't do what they really want to do or they don't do what they have the potential to do because they're walking around with these imaginary bars saying, I can't do this, and I can't do this. Oh, they won't say yes to me. They won't say, oh, no, that's a relative. I couldn't do that. No. Henry Ford said it. There isn't a person on the planet that can't do more than they think they can. I love that. Don't quote me. That's him. I love that. There isn't a person on the planet that can't do more than they think they can. Whatever you think you can do, you can do more. Oh, sorry, the lung band when you got the lung bands on. <laughs> Just you, I'm sorry about the power of Found a guy that hung himself in that horrible the girlfriend dumped me. Uh, and then I, I, I haven't got enough time to tell you everything. Oh, by the way, I said I don't put myself at risk of returning to a place like that, and I work in prisons. Do I look like Jeremy Kyle there? <laughs> <laughs> Who watches Jeremy Kyle? You <laughs> <laughs> should out on the <laughs> anyway, check yourself. But my girlfriend, John Ellis, oh, she was a real mate. Oh, yeah, she, John Ellis dumped me. Dumped me. Posh, posh girl, as well, by the way. I got told off by some clients, I got called a posh girl, and I got told off. So, uh, anyway, posh girl. Um, uh, when, to, when I went to meet her parents, this massive house, uh, mum got the silverware out, cut it up, in silverware, that all got. What she said to me, her uh, mum said to Joanne when I'd gone, First time she met me, she went, there's no way you're dating him. I'm not having my grandchildren running around in shell suits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I'm not tricking a phone, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very fun, though. Um, <laughs> where I got to myself? Anyway, she went to me. Yeah, relationships. I've had more relationships in my life than I can tell you how many I've Hundreds of really, not all relationships, by the way, some of them dance, all fake, all sorts of shenanigans. You write a book about it. Fifty shades of ginger. I <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what's really funny? I go all over the place, down on the train, and I see people, not, maybe not so much now, but like a couple years ago when it was out, you'd see people reading Fifty Shades of Grey, and they're trying to disguise the guy in the magazine. It's so, <laughs> so funny to see. That's just the men. <laughs> but I've had hundreds of relationships, always insecure, unfaithful, all that stuff, and uh, uh, I went to see the doctor whilst I was in prison, they gave me these tablets to the I got through my sentence and I came out of my prison, oh, all that joy had been released. Oh. Left me about three months later, I was back in court getting my house repossessed this time. We were about £5,000. And I remember the judge, civil judge, saying to me, you've got six weeks to get a job while you've lost your house. Oh, I went out there for interview after interview after interview. Did I go? Rejection. Rejection. Have never been rejected? Have never been rejected? <laughs> loads of times. Got to get rejected loads of things, you know, the government loads of things. Bam, rejection. Oh, you, you're perfect, Richard, but you, you've got this criminal record. We can't set you on, which I've since discovered was discrimination. Anyway, I kept going, I kept going, I kept going. And uh, in my six, I even considered taking my own life. Of course, I didn't want to do something for me. In my sixth and final week, I went for a. Uh, my bags were packed. I went for an interview, but nothing to lose. Two days to go. Nan nearly jumped on the desk and kissed him when he said to me, Richard, can you start on Monday? Yeah, I don't know. I've gone up to Sonia's. I can't wait to tell her. I actually think there was um, somebody looking after me up there. Maybe my mum, I don't know. Um, I know it's sound mad, but I do believe there's more to this world than you can see. It's been some very crazy coincidental things that happened in my life. Anyway, I 
said my house the last week, that was 1997. It's a message you've been loads of times, it's never given up. Keep going, keep going till you get what you want. If it's not working, we'll do another trial approach. If nothing's working at all, find someone else who it is working for and copy off them. It's okay to do that, more successful people, you know all this stuff. In fact, when I first came out of prison, I got myself another job on a weekend. At the Yorkshire Shooting Club, it worked seven days a week for two and a half years. I was no good at telling sales. I'll tell you what, Baljit Singh. It was brilliant, he was a superstar. He'd stand up on the phone, he was like, Mr. Motivator. I sat beside him. And I copied what he did. And I won canvas out of the year. A year after getting out of prison, I got a big plaque, 50 pounds, and a bottle of champagne. And I grew by <coughs> sitting alongside someone who was successful. You know all this stuff already. Hang around, that's why you're here today. Hang around with the successful, the, the successful I speak for a living. <laughs> <laughs> successful one. 1997 stayed in my house and I grew. Changed my circle of friends, I took the salsa dancing. Who does salsa? Come on, I was the one woman in that was salsa. <laughs> Do you know how long have you been dancing? Um, I've practiced probably about three years. Give a round of applause, come to the front. Come on, let's go dance, come on! Uh, 16th of July 2004. Who's read the first? Ever read the first book? 
just when we were going well, can you do that? Just like that, couldn't get it better, here's me happy, I mean, that's how it is. In a salsa club, uh, she's a midwife, and we were in James, don't know why James Bond there. Talk about films all the time, I feel like we're a director. We met in 2004, and I took Helen, my wife to be, up to Scotland to visit the house, I love this bit of my story, to visit the house my mum lived in as a young girl, up on the Isle of Skye. Who's been to the Isle of Skye? Isn't it beautiful? That there, you can't see because you're. Because you project a set of capture settings, not it's a 50% virus, I've just noticed by the way. That house there is the house someone lived in. And as I'm approaching that house, I don't know if sure this is the end idea, but as we approach the house that my mum lived in, out of this really dark cloud, is it me? Is it me? Or is it more for this world that we can fully explain? We're going to be okay, guys. Just smile. Just smile. It does look like smile. There's this ray of sunshine falling on mum's house. It was as if she was communicating. We ended up getting married on the doorsteps of that house. On the 1st of July, my mum's birthday, it was the closest we could get to hand my mum at our wedding. We didn't invite anybody. Which saved us a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one thing leads me with the don't ask me out, do not ask me out. But I thought it was them born. Aww. Her name is Sky, she's got a little ginger. She's actually in year four at school now, isn't she? Come on, isn't she? Ginger Massey. <laughs> Three minutes to <coughs> Stay calm under pressure. If you look at the video of the film that I've just shown you, um, that's not me, I mean. <laughs> it's, that was my son playing me in the film. Um, because they went my son Ellis. Oh. Why is that doing that? Anyway, um, it's called Ellis because the place we got married is in a place called Ellis. 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 Um, <laughs> it's called, uh, the place we got married is in a place called Ellie Shadow. That's where Scandal is getting the name for, but we didn't stop there because we only had a little, little Isla. Ginger. I've got three gingers. <laughs> three gingers. And um, I am the proud. Is that a very nice sound? I'm a proudest dad on the planet. And uh, um, you do know I don't live far from here, don't you? Bring me in. Bring me in. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. <laughs> That was going to do that. Uh, but I've got a little video for you of my kids. A few words. Are you ready? Yeah. Before we do that one. Uh, run VT. I'm professional. <laughs> think of it. Think of it. Uh... Uncle, to the city in Jim Massey. Jim Massey! Jim Massey! I can. 
I can't overcome this fear. So I did the first one and the second one, and they were uncomfortable, Tom. They were, they were horrible. But continuous and never ending. I got better and better. I got better anyway. It's all down over, hasn't it? It's good. Enough. I'm so glad that I said I can't overcome this fear because I have in the most, in, in, in the main anyway, I don't get uncomfortable, especially when I speak to chief execs. Can I speak to chief execs? Uh, that's what I do, what I do all around the world now. Um, to me, actually, um, Ginger Massey. <laughs> but my favourite audience has been the national. So every talk that I give, or I've given from 2000, hey, I just really didn't do marketing with you guys. Every talk I finished, I said, but my favourite audience, the biggest audience today was the National Indoor Arena. I show a picture of the big crowd at National Indoor Arena, but I took it out now. I don't know why I took it out, but anyway, it is. Um, and I, uh, I'm so proud of what that little boy at the age of five has gone on to achieve because he didn't understand back then. He's had to learn it the hard way. And you know what? We don't have to learn all this stuff the hard way. We're coming from a group of people like this. We're here sitting like me and Pete and all hey, But and, as somebody else, I'm really special. I don't have any special powers. I realise that you just do the stuff. But make sure you do the stuff, not think about the stuff. And uh, but this is one of my uh, African leaders, this one. I, I asked me at the, the Global Speaker Summit in Vancouver, Canada, in, on the 10th of December 2012. I represent, oh, sorry, last year, 2013. I represent the United Kingdom at the Global Speaker Summit. But let me tell you this, right? It wasn't a surprise that I did, because two years earlier, I was at the previous Global Speaker Summit in Amsterdam, and someone gave me a flyer, it's a postcard, saying Vancouver. I said, I'm going to speak there, I'm going to represent the United Kingdom. And I put on my noise board in my office, little magnet there, I'm going to do this. And I did everything within my power, by accessing those un unlimited resources that we've all got to do more. And I made it happen. Don't wait for other people to do it for you, do it guys. And this is my 1,669th presentation in the last 10 years. Do you know what? I've just come back from Iran. I've spoken in Iran. Shut. Oh, I'd rather not been speaking in Iran this year. Because it was to 1,000 cancer survivors. Because unfortunately, just because I've been through some stuff as a kid, it does not mean to say I'm immune from this stuff. Because last year, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. Jeez. She had to have a double mastectomy and reconstruction. It's been Bloody hell. But I tell you what, I'm not coming here to share this stuff because I'm ready to talk. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> As a five year old boy, I told myself a particular thing about mum's death and it helped me. And I tell you what, this positive stuff I've been sharing with you, sharing with you, it's on my heart and it works. It works. It's rubbed off on my wife and it's better equipped her to deal with what she's been through the last 12 months. Just so you know. She's been told she's got a 98% chance of being here in five years' time, and I'll settle for that. I wish she was here, you know what, because she's the one that, that, that deserves this kind of ovation, and I think we have to kind of recognise our partners and how they support us. She's like the, the unsung hero in our family, the way that she puts things out for me. And, oh, I left on Friday for London. She had, this little, she had these homemade uh, little chocolate cakes and she had me eating this for the weekend. And, oh, do you know what? I know, married a gem there. I wish I knew she was here to hear it. Um, but I'm going to finish now. <laughs> I wish I knew she was here to hear it. I wish I knew If I can overcome the things that I've been through, and I've not, I've not actually shared it with you yet, but I've shared most of it. Remember, it was murdered by a serial killer. Look at me that way. Beaten with sticks at the register, set the streets on a few occasions, you know, low self esteem, no qualifications, kicked out of the army, drugs, prison. My fault, I know it was my fault. Wife and cancer, now all that. My beloved sister. That's her. <laughs> taking her life in 2007. If I can go on to achieve the things that I've achieved despite all that stuff, I'm going to achieve far more than I ever dreamt possible, you know, if I can. You know what's going to do it? What do you